Let's, all right, cool. So, all right, Ruby conference for December. Cognitive emulation and algebra. So, people have talked about, like, there's so many different ways to, like, talk about or theorize or consider cognitive emulation on, like, a regular, you know, I don't know, in terms of the various narratives that's out there, but I'm not entirely sure that the way that other people utilize cognitive emulation, or at least the way that they think about, you know, how or why they do it, is pretty accurate. So, for example, um, let's say, um, let's say you have, um, you know, you have a person, right? And then uh, you have uh, another person, but they're not very, uh, they're not very compatible. So let's say you have an ENFP and then you have an ENTP, for example. And uh, it's just not really gonna, it's just not going well for that. I mean, you got N E F I T E S I. And you have N E T I F E S I. Now they got decent uh, emotional compatibility in there, and that's that's cool. So in terms of decision making, that's fine. But in terms of uh, uh, in terms of their uh, perception functions, um, which we have with the N E and S I, and then the N E and the S I on both sides, this ends up creating conflict. And the conflict is basically uh, competition over uh, competition over comfort, basically, uh, or uh, competition over uh, what might be, right? And that could be a problem. That could be a consistent issue. So how do you solve this issue? What do you, what do you do? Well, the answer is ultimately it's cognitive emulation. So let's look at, uh, you know, something, um, something basic in terms of cognitive emulation. In order to understand cognitive emulation a little bit more, we need to go back into cognitive axis, cognitive axis theory. So cognitive axis, um, basically is SE is connected to NI, and then NE is connected to SI. And you have TE connected to FI, and then you have TI connected to, uh, oops, excuse me. We have FE connected to uh, TI, right? But what happens when you're missing? You know, each of the following types you need to choose like, uh, one or the other, you can't have both, right? And if you're in an interaction with a fellow human being and you're kind of uh, limited as a result of that interaction with that human being, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of limitations that, you know, you could, you kind of have to deal with. So it's like, okay, uh, we're competing for comfort, right? Or, or who, who is the person, uh, who is the person who is, who's the idea person of the relationship or the friendship, right? How do we, how do we get in the way of that? Or how do we prevent any potential conflict? Well, we've all heard the old adage, uh, fake it, uh, till, um, you make it right. So, and that's basically the basis of the social engineering tactic known as cognitive uh, emulation. And you're just trying to emulate uh, certain things. So we're going to consider extroverted sensing uh, versus introverted intuition. Uh, it, you could potentially uh, create, um, you could potentially uh, create um, a form of, uh, a form of S-I-N-E on the outside. Or like if we're gonna do the same thing to uh, F-E or T-I, you could create basically um, F-I or T-E uh, based on your behavior. It just takes a lot of effort, right? Why does it take a lot of effort? Well, we're gonna erase this part of the board here. Let's we'll take, take a look as to why it takes a lot of effort. So let's look at a um, let's look at an ISTJ. All right. So an ISTJ, S I T E, um, F I 
N E S E T I F E N I, right? Well, let's look at the frames per second, right? So 175, 50, 25, 20, 15, uh, 10, and 5, okay? Pretty, uh, pretty simple, pretty standard, all right? Well, the problem is, is that if you have a low frames a second, you're not going to be able to provide, uh, you know, the most optimal interaction, right? So in the case of an ISTJ, we're missing a lot of FE, right? But in order to actually produce FE, you end up doing something like this. So it's 100 uh, plus 75 plus 50 plus 25 plus 20 plus 15, right? What does all that add up to? So this is 35 plus 25. So that's, um, so that's 55 plus 50 is 105. Uh, plus 75 is 180 plus 200, so that's 280, you know, FPS, okay? And that's a lot of effort just to force out that missing uh, 10 FPS of FE, right? That's a lot of effort. That's an insane amount of effort just to be able uh, to come up with, uh, you know, the difference, you know, it's, it's a lot of energy that you have to spend and people get tired. And that's why emulation doesn't exactly work that well, because oh, it's the amount of energy it takes to actually produce one of the other functions. And when you're combining the functions, you're combining, you know, some of their frames per second, it takes completely the entire effort of the mind in order for this ISTJ to even comprehend or behave in a social norm, to actually care about a social norm, right? Well, what it ends up doing is that they have to come to a situation where it's like, okay, I'm being grateful with my uh, FI child such that through cognitive orbit, I am able to actually produce extroverted feeling, right? So, uh, because expressing gratitude is definitely something uh, FE, users, uh, FE users need. Now, interestingly enough, SI plus SFI, these people can remember to express uh, gratitude, but sometimes they get lazy and then they don't express a gratitude. But if this person was an INTJ, well, they might actually forget to express gratitude. But they might remember to express gratitude because they may remember what other people have done for them. So both types, because of FI child, they are at risk of being unable to behave ethically due to the lack of gratitude. But how do each of these types become cognizant that they need to actually be more grateful? Well, the answer is, is that they actually have to try. The, the ISTJ either needs to develop the habit of showing gratitude or the INTJ uh, needs to uh, create a system or uh, just to actually like use all of their willpower uh, to express that gratitude because without that gratitude there they're never actually going to be able to develop their FE function especially you know from a, a cognitive integration uh, point of view right so in this example it's taking the ISTJ literally everything they have to produce a, a result from their FE function and to basically emulate FE, you know? So when you're using cognitive axis, you know, they, uh, um, you have to recognize that the opposite is true. You know, what happens when you hear about like, uh, uh, you know, cross multiplying, um, you know, 100 over one versus, um, you know, uh, 100 over 46, et cetera and then you, you cross multiply and then you get a result, right? It's a similar approach when you're talking about cognitive functions. Very, very similar approach. Uh, because what your brain is doing is under cognitive, you know, under uh, cognitive emulation is that, okay, hey, you know, uh, so we have, uh, let's see here. Could do like X and Y. So, um, so you have like four X within your ego. Um, uh, four X in your equal ego. Um, 
uh, minus 3y and your super ego equals 1y basically and then you have to solve right so effectively that's why it takes so so much energy uh, for anyone to use their cognitive functions in such a way to be able to produce literally that one y which would equal you know the trickster function in this case right i'm using a very poor mathematical model right now and i apologize so but the bottom line is is that when you're looking at uh when you're looking at cognitive uh, emulation, you want to get to a point where um, you recognize that anyone is able to emulate any uh, functions that they're missing. Um, there's also another theory out there. It's something that my, um, my mentor first taught me about a long time ago. We didn't put a name to it, but I call it uh, downshift theory. And downshift theory, so for example, let's look at an ENTJ for downshift theory. So downshift theory, and then looking at this ENTJ, T-E-N-I-S-E-F-I, -E -E right? T-I-N-E-S-I-F-E, -E, okay? Downshift theory is basically, you know, sometimes an ENTJ uh, can experience something known as fear of abandonment okay fear of abandonment right we have fear of abandonment the fear of abandonment is usually uh se inferior uh so that's usually se inferior that's what is attached to fear of abandonment but sometimes se child can have fear of abandonment too Sometimes SE hero can have fear of abandonment as well. And they all three can have fear of abandonment. Why is that? Something my mentor told me about the inferior hero or the inferior child, or in some cases, the demonic child. It's when the cognitive functions can combine with each other to create different results. The demonic child is when a child ends up becoming a very demonic, uh, you know, property basically it becomes instead of a slave to the hero it becomes a slave to the superego essentially or feeding one's child function to the superego but through these cognitive combining that of these cognitive functions uh, they're actually able to emulate similar behaviors that are latent or natural to other types initially right so this ends up presenting a problem because you know well, this is one of the reasons why you can't exactly uh, type somebody just based on cognitive functions. Because anything that you would ever suggest when typing this on, which is cognitive functions, it would be, you're literally just finding yourself relying on uh, stereotypes. And you can't rely on stereotypes when typing somebody. It's just not going to work. You can't do it, right? So uh, downshift theory is, is like, let's say you have an SE hero. That SE hero could still behave childish. That SE hero could still behave in some of the other slots, some of the other cognitive attitudes. It just depends on, is it getting pulled down by the superego or is it getting pulled up by the hero? Is it operating within its negative charge or its positive charge? Is it a double negative? Is it a double positive? Is it a triple negative? Uh, what cognitive function is it serving? What other function is it? What gateway is it serving? Is it serving the gateway of the subconscious? Is it serving the gateway of the hero, right? All of these things need to be considered. The problem is, is that, like I said, you can't just identify someone by a basic cognitive function because that's not literally how it works. It gets even further than that. This is why, you know, when I look at the human soul, you have a cognitive axis, right? So cognitive axis ends up looking like this. You know, it's going around something here. Another one's going around this way, right? And another one's going around this way. And another one's going around this way. And it's behaving like an atom. Sometimes those functions intersect. What happens when they intersect? 
what happens if they end up trading places and they go on a different axis than they were going before temporarily until they intersect again and then they're reset back on their original axis again, right? What happens then? You know, the problem is, is that most of the models that we have about the cognitive functions nowadays is actually pretty linear. When in reality situation, they're all in a sphere. It's not a two-dimensional model. It's a multi-dimensional model. Uh, look at cognition in terms of an abacus and not necessarily, um, not necessarily like, you know, just something flat on a sheet of paper. Because you have cognitive axis, you have cognitive orbits, you know, and then each of their individual axes, uh, it, it, could be, it could be an issue. There's so much there. And everything is being tugged and pulled in different directions. So a cognitive function may be pulled in one direction by its axis, but it's also orbiting another one at the same time. What does that actually visually look like? Well, let's take a look. Are you talking about the loops? Yeah, that would, that would count. But I thought the loops are, um, uh, the, when 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 loops are talked about, isn't it more in a kind of a negative way of not so much in a positive way that um, your hero and parent, like you wouldn't call that a loop, right? Because that wouldn't be a negative. That would be when you're at your best, right? Yes. Now, loops can be good, it can be bad, it just depends uh, which the situation is. It's a little too subjective there. I can't make a hard judgment in that direction. But let's, let's, look, at the, let's look at it this way. Here's SE inferior, okay? Here's SE inferior. And it's going to be, um, and it's on the same axis as an I hero, okay? They're on the same axis. They're going the same direction, these two, right? But then what is SE, what is orbiting SE inferior? Well, what orbits SE inferior is SI trickster or, uh, or SI demon. You see, and you can also do the opposite of this as well. But, you know, this is necessary if you consider it because like one of these cognitive functions behaves like the sun, but any of these cognitive functions could actually behave like the sun, if you think about it. What is keeping our souls together? How does this work? Well, let's look at a different, let's look at a different model um, specifically. Let's look at, um, let's see. And here's the sun, soul, right? So, um, and then you have the earth. And the Earth is traveling in this direction, right? It's it's say it's traveling counterclockwise, right? But the Earth is turning on its axis um, clockwise, okay? Counterclockwise and clockwise simultaneously. What this ends up doing is this ends up creating a force from the sun. Think of the earth like the yo-yo, but it's going in the opposite direction, you know? So, or actually, excuse me, I did that wrong. Let me, let me fix this.
the Earth is going uh, clockwise as well at the same time. You know, kind of like when you have one of those uh, little spirals that go like this, right? And then this motion here has a bunch of uh, pressure, right? What happens when you throw down a yo-yo like that and it's trying to roll up again, right? The problem is, is that this yo-yo is still moving in that direction. It's just not rolling up towards the sun. Something is preventing the earth from being pulled into the sun. What is that? Well, there's another force here that's in the way, right? And that would be some other kind of celestial body on its own trajectory, or maybe it's going this way. Maybe it's doing both. And as much as the earth may be going that way, maybe the earth too is going this way, you know, as it's going in whichever direction it's going. What this ends up creating is a positive and a negative force at the same time. This is magnetism, and it's this kind of magnetism which simulates something that we know as, which is known as like a, you know, gravity, right? A gravitational pull, right? And I'm not an astro astrophysicist. I don't really know anything about this. I'm trying to use this as some lame model to try to explain how cognitive functions kind of interact with each other in the soul. Being aware of these positive and negative uh, magnetic poles and whatnot, you can kind of see how the cognitive functions themselves are kind of like a, a solar system within our souls. And they have different orbits and different axes, right? Things turn on an axis with each other as polar opposites. And as they're turning on an axis with one another, it's like having a, um, you know, almost like a, a sun and a moon effect, but then everything is also orbiting something else, right? So that's also very interesting. So you have a cognitive axis and it's turning opposite of each other, but then you also have, uh, it orbiting around something like this, kind of like a blender, you know? And this is what happens in our brains with our souls. Then when you look at the law of opposites or the law of inverses, you can see that through cognitive transition, you can behave the opposite of what you may behave. It just takes a lot of energy. And then you could reverse your polarity from a positive charge to a negative charge which is basically you're solving for X in an algebraic situation, right? You're trying to solve for what's missing. You're trying to solve the missing uh, unaware trickster function, for example, could be any function. And then for a short amount of time, you're able to produce the output of whatever function that is. This is really advanced and hard to explain. I'm not, I still haven't figured out the best way of explaining it, but I hope this generally makes sense. Um, any questions about that so far? No, okay. So why is this relevant? It's relevant because when you're looking at the 16 personalities, you have four cognitive functions in your ego. You have four sides of your mind, potentially 16 different co uh, cognitive functions with whichever four side of the mind it's its own auxiliary function, its own parent function. Are those parent functions developed? What's your cognitive focus? If your cognitive focus is in a developed or undeveloped state, this is where, you know, people can argue subtypes. Dave's superpowers and his, you know, subtypes theory. Well, that's kind of how subtypes works within four sides, the mind theory. It's, it's more like uh, 
people are very different based on what stage of development they are in cognitively, right? And it's based on, you know, and they're able to emulate certain actions and other actions they're not able to emulate based on their nurture and their life experiences, where they've come from, et cetera, uh, in as much as their nature is too. But their nature changes over time, not outside of like the confines of their pers personality in terms of the four sides of their mind and the cognitive functions that exist. But when you inverse into your subconscious by flipping your ego upside down or you inverse into your superego by flipping your unconscious upside down, basically, uh, it's almost like you're a completely different person, but you're not. You're just accessing more of you. You're discovering more of your own self, basically, in the process. It could just cost a lot of energy. And if that energy is used in a chaotic way versus a, a orderly way, it could produce different results, which gives you potentially 16 squared different possible um, outcomes or perspectives of cognition, basically. Because at whatever point, at whatever function within all four sides of your mind that you exist in, if that's your perspective, if that's the function you're choosing to be your hero at that moment, if you're choosing to use that tool at that moment for that particular point in time, uh, you're, it's like you're, uh, you're able to see the rest of your personality from that different point in space-time within the existence of your soul instead of uh, necessarily defaulting from your hero. It's kind of like you're in a solar system and you're standing on top of Europa in orbit of Jupiter and you're seeing the solar system from that point of view. Scientists for many, many uh, centuries, and it still happens to now, I think it's called uh, um, uh, something centrism, but it's basically thinking that the earth is the center of the universe. Uh, it's pretty natural for anyone to think anything is the center of any universe from their point of view anyway. And as much as anyone thinks that their own point of view is the center of reality, it's all about perspective and point of view. What is your point of view? Are you seeing Europa orbiting, orbiting uh, Jupiter as uh, the center of the universe? Are you seeing the Earth as the center of the universe? Are you seeing the sun as the center of the universe? Are you seeing the galaxy as the center? Where is your center at that moment in time? It, it's pretty easy for your center to be Sol or the sun within our solar system. It's pretty easy because it's big. You know, the hero function, it's pretty big, easy because it's big. It's a lot harder to see things from the perspective of a much smaller planet or a planet that's further away or a planet that's not as inhabitable. A hero function and a parent function, those are very habitable. But a trickster or a demon function, they're not as habitable, right? So it's hard to see things from their point of view. But you could travel there, just like you could travel through our solar system to a location. You could travel to that place within your soul and get there. But sometimes you have to fight against the force of gravity in the process of within your own cognitive development, right? I have a, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So let's just say, let's just say when you're typing, and you know uh, let's say you're you know you're typing someone and you know you're not you're using the temperaments but it's just but you're verifying it with other you know models um isn't there a way to know when the hero is a te and then you know with the loop um seeing what what you know what they resonate with more as far as like with you know an ne versus like an se where an ne would be uh um well se would be more you know uh they would overindulge with food um maybe uh the 
they would, you know, have a sensory, you know, they're more sense, have a sensory um, indulgement where an NE is more about novelties, right? Where um, NE's more about, you know, uh, an ESTJ or ESTJ, you would see, you know, at Disneyland wearing like a Mickey Mouse shirt, but knowing that no one could see him, he would, he would be, uh, he would actually be more prone to do something like that than versus, you know, eating a lot or, or having a relationship more with the outside world or I don't know. I'm just. Right. I'm having a hard time following, man. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to, I got so much long day here. I'm just trying to, um, uh, the NE is going to show up different as a SE, correct? So when, when you're, say, typing someone, can't you figure out if they're an ESTJ versus like an ENTJ just by the, the loop with the hero and the child? Um, so are you saying that, well, through hero and child, I mean, yeah, you could, but what if they're very mature? What if they're very immature? Like, how do you know? What if their parent function is developed or not? You know what I mean? Like, how could you know for sure? Well, I'm saying they would have more of a relation, uh, a relationship with, say like an ENTJ versus an ESTJ, they would have more of a relationship with an SE versus an NE, right? Right. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm just, you know, for vice versa. Or an ISTJ with an ISFJ, where I, you know, uh, someone that's an ISTJ would, you know, uh, they would, recognize an fi versus a ti right but i mean look look at it in terms of magnets though what happens when you put two si users next to each other and it's two positives they repel each other they repulse each other so the si user at that point is like okay i need to try to uh create a negative charge so that we're not repulsing each other because we're in a situation where we have to one of us has to change our behavior in some way, shape or form. And it takes a lot of effort for them to flip their magnet to a different side to be able to produce that uh, uh, negative charge to deal with the other person's positive charge. So there's no repulsion, but they can't hold that on for that much longer, right? Right. It's no, a I magnetic field, that's right. what I'm saying. And, they, and it's effectively that's how you're solving for X from an algebraic standpoint is because you have the cognition within you as a human being. It's just what can you produce and for how long are you going to be able to maintain the ability to do so and how much effort are you willing to put in? Right. I mean, so like me being like an SC user versus an SI and, and I'm talking as far as like a pair, uh, uh, hero versus child. Uh, now someone has SI and, you know, the hero or the child they're, you know, I've noticed that they're like really into the holidays or uh, they, they're they very traditional type people where I, I mean, for me, for Christmas, it's like, you know what, for kids, we already did that. And it's for children where my wife has a SI child and she's all in the, you know, dec you know, decorating and putting everything, uh, you know, putting a lot of effort into decorating for Christmas where I, I, I don't want to decorate. Right. And now that's fine. They're handling that other side of it for you. <laughs> right. You know, just, just like right there with the, above the window. Remember you noticed right away the, oops, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, above the window there, the holiday uh, or the reef that's hanging. Yeah. You know. So, uh, that's all. I was just. Fair enough. Um, 
I mean, remember, cognitive functions are like preferences, right? And to flip your magnet the other way, it's like, okay, this is not a, a preference that I want to, uh, to do, you know? Cognitive emulation is literally just magnetism. You're willfully choosing to change your polarity. And sometimes other people can change your polarity for you against your will, which can also be problems, right? It could be a chaotic change, it could be an orderly change or a plan change, right? A P change versus a J change, right? And that could be problematic. So this is why people have such a hard time taking these tests because it's like, okay, are my calling in transition right now? Am I being honest with myself? Are they being more towards their ego, right? It's just nice enough to know, like when you're typing somebody, uh, your ego is what is, you know, most available. It's what's out there, right? That's the difference. But the problem is, is that, you know, over time you could see how it's very primary and not secondary, but for other people, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, why? Well, they could be calling a transition. They could have a really stressful day. Uh, there could be somebody else present in the room with them. There could be additional social pressure or rule pressure or pressure in general that's throwing them off. Uh, human beings are very pressuresome. And to, I, to really get somebody in that mode where there is no pressure and they're absolutely comfortable and it's fine, okay, yeah, you know, their, their ego is a lot more free. It's kind of like when you have a child in a family and you have parents who already who uh, if you have a parent and a child who have the exact same ego one of them has to cognitive transition to deal with the other because they both repel each other they are repulsive to each other because they have the same charges and it's difficult to maintain a relationship with those uh with those with that, that repulsion right so all right well uh that's the end of the conference for today. Uh, do you have any questions before we go? No. All right, cool. I'll see you guys next month for the Ruby conference. Happy New Year. Take care. All right, later. Bye. Later.